Hello everyone, welcome to my Resident Evil 5 professional difficulty. No upgrades, last no stores, last no infinite ammo walkthrough. And this is chapter 6-3, the final chapter of this amazing Resident Evil game. And my god, does it go out with a bang. This chapter really feels like an ending to a game. It really does. It feels very epic. You know, you have the awesome music, you have all these enemy types coming after you. It's really cool. I mean, the only annoying thing about this chapter is the explosions, because the explosions uh, affect your uh, accuracy and aiming, and it can make it very difficult to uh, see enemies, and, you know, it, it screws you over sometimes, but you've just got to learn how to deal with it, because this is a lot of fun. Now, the trickiest part is this part right here. When you pull this lever, the spawn is completely random. There's no telling where the enemies will spawn from. But there is a safe spot, and Sheva's going to be so useful in helping me out here. So you want to go into this corner here. Uh, be very careful here. There's a chance there's a grenade guy who will spawn above you, so be prepared to shoot him after you uh, use a shotgun on this guy who drops down. You know, it's random. You know, you're either going to get one enemy, or you're either going to get three enemies coming from that spot. You know, there's a lot of RNG in this particular uh, section, only for this first part, and then the the rest of the chapter is not so heavy on RNG, thankfully. And look at that! Look! Look, th that was tense right there. Thankfully the grenade fell off. I was screwed otherwise. And Sheva's actively trying to shoot the guys who are running towards us, and it does kind of slow her down, but it's not too big of a deal, because I can just shoot them with the shotgun, and then Sheva can just finish them off. Yeah, this is a pretty challenging chapter. It's challenging, but fun. That's all I'll say. And the, all the ammunition you got from Chapter 6 too is really helpful here. You know, if you have a lot of rifle ammo, you're going to be able to do this first part very easily. The shotgun's going to come in handy, the pistol's going to be very reliable, and the grenades are going to be especially handy. You need to make sure you save at least uh, two grenades. Uh, maybe four if you're trying to use two grenades on the two Reapers that spawn. And then use the uh, other two grenades on the Gatling Gunners that spawn, because you're going to be fighting two Gatling Gunners uh, near the end of this uh, first part of uh, chapter 6-3. Uh, but before that, we have uh, several gunners. Once again, make sure you're being very cautious of guys with grenades. There's no telling where they'll spawn. And uh, eek out ever so slightly to be able to shoot the guys with the guns. Because they can't hit you so long as you stand there. Some of them will try to rush you, so be very careful. And just pay attention. And also, it's random as to whether uh, certain enemies will have helmets or not, just like in uh, chapter 5-3. And uh, there's a guy there. The The gunners like to run around a lot on the other side. So you can use that to ambush them before they have a chance to actually get a clear line of sight with you and start shooting you. And also, here's, a cover, here's the cover system. I didn't demonstrate the cover system as much in uh, the other chapters. But the cover system on this game is really good. I don't know why Serpent17 says the cover system is bad. Like, he says there's a lot of delay, the, the aiming, and there's all that kind of stuff, but I don't know what he's talking about. I have never have any trouble with the cover system. The only time the cover system is going to be bad is if you're using the S75, because the bolt-action effect of the uh, S75 causes you to remain out of cover longer than you should be, and you'll end up taking hits. But that's only with the S75. Every other weapon, you just go back into cover immediately, because there's no sort of uh, pulling back on the bolt for any of the other weapons. And it's very fast, it's very responsive, and thankfully it's just mapped to square. Resident Evil 6's cover system is trash. The amount of times I accidentally go into cover on Resident Evil 6 because it's mapped to the aiming button, it's so stupid. I don't know what Capcom was thinking when they designed the cover system in Resident Evil 6, because for the most part it's incredibly useless. There's no reason for the cover system to exist in Resident Evil 6. I mean, the better alternative to the cover system in Resident Evil 6 is to use the reticle and just shoot around the corner because... The third-person cover trick is so powerful in Resident Evil 6 when you're using the reticle. It doesn't work with the laser sight, but uh, if you want to go for reticle, just use that. But I am a laser sighted guy because the laser sight is a Resident Evil thing, and I'm going to play a Resident Evil game the way it's actually intended to actually feel like a Resident Evil game. And that's why I stick with the laser sight. A very innovative sight. Now, there's going to be several guys on your right there's going to be guys up top. There's going to be guys on your left as well. Uh, they, they don't come to the left often. They mainly come from above or from the right. And there's a rocket launcher guy. Thankfully, he's being very passive because he can't see me. 
And Sheba is once again being an incredibly good uh, partner and watching my back. But yeah, look, look at this. They are not so keen on trying to shoot me. They have to get to very specific spots, and this really opens them up to a lot of vulnerabilities. And it just helps balance this section out a lot. Uh, just be very cautious. Uh, there are a lot more enemies uh, than you think. But thankfully it's not too many enemies like there are with those offspring in Chapter 6 too. And, uh, okay, I've cleared out the, the enemies, and now we're... Oh no, there's still one more guy. Uh, correction, I think there's actually, uh, two more. Yeah, there, there's actually two more. I killed this guy thinking that he's the last guy, but something incredible happens, and you're gonna see it in the moment. There's still one enemy left, and he's he's not, uh, in my line of sight. So, I assume that the, uh, last enemy has been dealt with for this first part. But then I go to pull the lever, and w watch this, watch this. Look at that! I got so lucky just then that thankfully the iframe saved me. And now he's just gonna die in one shotgun blast. And now a bunch of Reapers are going to spawn. So, a cool trick to note about the uh, Reapers is that when you uh, damage them twice with grenades, it puts them really close to low life. So they'll pretty much die almost instantly from a shotgun. As you're gonna see in a moment. And thankfully, uh, every time they uh, re return back to their neutral state, their weak spot's exposed. Like just then, he mantled, but his uh, weak spot uh, was exposed the moment he finished his animation. It's the same when you uh, stun them and then they re return back to your neutral state. It's the same when that you uh, use the grenades on them. It's so cool. And we're gonna finish off this Reaper. You gotta finish him off very quickly before the Gatling Gunners spawn. Because they do put a lot of pressure on you. And now we're get we need to use uh, two grenades here. You just gotta wait until the Gatling Gunners spawn. So uh, go ahead and stand down here. Prep your grenades. So, because we're gonna be using the grenades to stun the Gatling Gunners and make a run for the turret. But make sure you don't throw them too fast. You've got to time your grenade throws so that you can keep them stunned. And the uh, spawn's about to happen in three... Oh, never mind. And there's the first grenade. Throw it, like, all the way up. That stuns them. And then prep your next grenade, wait until they start to recover, and then throw it. And thankfully, they're stunned long enough for you to get on the turret and start stun-locking them. And then, uh, Sheba is going to provide you with a lot of cover. She's so reliable in this part. It's a shame she's not very reliable in the Wesker fight. The Wesker fight is one of the best boss fights in the game, but Sheva gets in the way a lot. And she takes some very awkward paths. She gets hit by Wesker very easily. But thankfully that, that didn't happen to me in this video. I got it on the first attempt. Because Fascinator told me that uh, if you tell Sheva to disable the lights. She uh, is not so keen on standing in your way when you're dealing with Wesker. And if you tell her to go into attack mode she'll just keep uh, looting everything. And that buys you a lot of time to deal with Wesker. Because Wesker goes down really fast during this boss fight. And as you can see the strategy is working. Just keep stunning the Gatling Gunners. Just hope uh, Sheva is dealing with the enemies. Uh, those two enemies are dead. And now we just gotta finish off the Stragglers. Because these enemies are infinite so long as those Gatling Gunners are alive. Or not infinite, there's just a lot more than usual. When those Gatling Gunners are alive. And cool thing to note about the Gatling Gunners is they do do friendly fire to the enemies. They can actually damage other enemies which is really cool. So, if you're doing a very restricted run, maybe you can use the Gatling Gunners in a very creative way to deal with the enemies in this section if you're on a restricted run. It'd be really cool to experiment with that. Like, they can actually damage each other as well, which is so cool. They can damage each other, they can damage other Magini, they can probably damage the Reapers. There's a lot of room for experimentation in this particular section. It's really cool. But that is the end of this awesome section, and now we are moving on to the Wesker fight. Which, as I mentioned, is one of the best boss fights ever made in the Resident Evil series. So long as uh, Shev is not being a, too uh, too much of a problem. Make sure you take Sheva's weapon away so, so she's not uh, shooting Wesker. Uh, run over here, tell Sheva to start disabling the lights, and she's going to buy you a lot of time to deal with Wesker. So uh, here's something you need to note to get behind Wesker. When he's walking you out like, like this, uh, take a very sharp angle and just get behind him, because he's very slow to react. 
And I should be using the shotgun or the sniper rifle. Don't use the pistol. The pistol takes about 10 shots to fully stun Wesker, and then you can do the, uh, the big combo attack on him. Whereas with the shotgun, it takes about 5 shots. With the rifle, apparently it takes, uh... Like seven shots as fast as you described, although that doesn't really make any sense. You would think it would take about five shots, actually. Or maybe even three shots, because the sniper rifle is a lot stronger than the shotgun. So I don't know if uh, Fascinator is correct in saying seven shots with the rifle or not. I mean, I haven't tested it because I've never used the rifle. But what I can say for sure is if you're using the knife or the uh, unupgraded machine gun, it takes forever to stun him, to actually put him into this combo state. And I know this because I actually tried to do knife only on Wesker and failed miserably. <laughs> I got a lot of views for that video too, which I question the way YouTube uh, prioritizes videos. Somehow I get more views for uh, videos that don't showcase uh, any kind of walkthrough strategies or anything like interesting for a boss. I, I get more views for simply showcasing a bio of a character, like for instance with my Stefano Valentini video on The Wolf and 2, or for my fail videos. I mean, it's not entirely true because I did get a lot of views for the uh, double fat molded boss fight in uh, Resident Evil 7 on Madhouse difficulty, and also for uh, Final Form Jack in uh, Resident Evil 7 on Madhouse difficulty. Those are the only two exceptions, but for the most part, I'll never understand the way YouTube prioritizes its videos. It's one of the main reasons why I barely get any views on my videos, because of the fact that YouTube never ever tries to prioritize any of the smaller channels. It's always prioritizing the bigger channels. And that's why my channel is so obscure on YouTube. But uh, Wesker is about to be done with. After he uh, says ignorant fools, don't try to uh, go for the uh, injection immediately. He always shakes you off. Always go for him after the second time you've uh, hard stunned him. And you will end the fight. A really fantastic boss fight that's really well designed, so long as Sheva's not being too annoying. Yeah, there's only three sections in the game that have a showcase where Sheva can be a problem. In Chapter 2-1, in Chapter 5-3. I mean, not, I'm not even counting Chapter 5-3 because the strategy I use is perfect. So that Sheva's not in the way. So the, in actuality, there's only two sections where Sheva's a problem. Chapter 2-1 and Chapter 6-3. The only two sections of the game where Sheva's actually a problem. And yet people try to maintain the belief that Chev is a problem throughout the full entire game, but they're idiots. What I have showcased right now, in my entire walkthrough, is Sheva being an absolute goddess. She's so good! She's really good, but... If people are still gonna maintain the belief that Sheva is trash after viewing my entire walkthrough, they are just completely delusional people. They just don't like to be wrong at all. They really don't. And these same people will watch these videos and they're like, Oh, you're still an arrogant fool, this and that. Well, who's displaying arrogance now when you think you know everything, but you clearly don't? You know nothing about the AI. I can name several people, but I'm not going to waste time with that. But uh, anyway, enough about that. We're on to the uh, final boss fight with Wesker, which is uh, a gimmick fight. But I'm going to do something incredibly risky here. I'm going to knock over the boulder at the beginning, and then I'm going to try to hit Wesker's back, because his back is completely exposed while he's doing that particular attack. And also, make make sure you give Sheva a weapon. You have to give Sheva a weapon if you want to progress the fight. Because the only way to progress this fight is for Sheva to enrage Wesker to the point where he actually starts to come after Sheva. And that way Sheva actually moves towards you. So because of the fact that I knocked over the boulder, Sheva's gonna come over to my side really quickly. And not have to wait on me. I admit it's incredibly risky, and I probably shouldn't have even done it, but as long as you have a sniper rifle, you can hit his back very easily. You can even do it with the handgun as well. It's what I do on co-op all the time. Just to speed things up. And now he's going after Sheva. You've got to protect Sheva because Sheva will be killed by Wesker while she's uh, trying to climb up after she falls. So she's fallen and it takes her quite a while to get up. So you've got to make sure Wesker is uh, focused on you by uh, stunning him. And it takes two shots from the PSG-1 to stun him. It takes a lot more shots with the handgun, unfortunately. Thankfully, uh... By the time uh, Wesker gets over to Sheva, after the first stun... Sheva will have already recovered. <laughs> I will say though, do doing that section as Sheva is really, really annoying. With having to mash the buttons so much just to keep Sheva alive. I mean, it's not that much of a problem. I mean, it, it can be done very easily without any fault. 
but it's just annoying that you have to tab square so fast for such a long duration. <laughs> it's painful. It's really painful on the fingers. And speaking of QTEs, the, the final QTE needed to finish off Wesker is ridiculously strict on professional difficulty because you've got to mash X like a psychopath if you want to succeed in actually finishing off Wesker. Like, I'd need to use both of my fingers to actually mash the X button so fast to do the quick time event. Because if you're not mashing the button fast enough, Wesker will just actively damage you. And if you go into the dying state when you grab Wesker, he'll kill both of you instantly. But uh, before that point, we need to stun Wesker twice. You need to shoot his back, and then Wesker will always retaliate with a tornado attack, which he's doing right now. And then after he finishes this tornado attack, his front weak spot will expose. You don't have to shoot the weak spot and get behind him in order to trigger the uh, quick time event. You can also get behind him while he's doing an attack animation. Like right now, he's doing his range attack. But look at that. I triggered the QTE without having to shoot the front weak spot. That's really cool. But just mash X like crazy. This QTE is almost impossible to do with just one hand. You've got to really use both of your fingers if you want to succeed. Just use both of your index fingers and just mash X like crazy. That's how I do it. And that is the end of this phenomenal boss fight. There's just one more thing we have to do to truly make it feel like a Resident Evil experience. We need to finish off the final boss with a power weapon. And in this case, it's the um, rocket launcher. And we get one of the most epic, most climatic boss fights ever in Resident Evil history. And I'm going to quote the famous Ethan, Ethan Winters on this. Playtime is over. Playtime is indeed over for this boss fight, for this fantastic Resident Evil game. Resident Evil 5 is a fantastic game that's a truly masterful co-op experience. And it, my god is it full of Resident Evil stuff. And that is the end of this phenomenal game, of this amazing walkthrough. Thank you all for watching, and you take care now.